So I'd like to start off uh, by thanking Joe Lamac and the Center for Mark Twain Studies um, for giving me the opportunity to share my work with you uh, today. Um, and thank you also to all of you for coming out uh, this evening. It's a really, really great honor uh, to be staying at Quarry Farm uh, and also be part of this fantastic tradition of, uh, of the Park Church Lecture Series. I'm just really, really delighted uh, to be here, so thank you. Um, so I thought I'd start off by saying a few words about my interest um, in this topic, um, topic of my lecture. Uh, so I am from Israel originally, um, and I've always been really intrigued by the complexities of uh, interpreting, interpreting uh, sacred spaces. Um, so for instance, what makes a spot sacred? Um, and in literature, can the experience of, uh, of holiness be fully articulated in writing? Um, and these are some of the questions that are on my mind in reading 19th century um, Protestant American travel writing about the Holy Land. And I was, as I was reading um, Twain's travel narrative for the first time, um, where he deta details his um, kind of futile search for sanctity, um, and I want to acknowledge also the irony of kind of discussing this topic um, and this very irreverent text in this, in this setting here. Um, so as I was reading the text, I became really fascinated by this um, by this clash between um, the tourist imagination and the tourist reality. Um, so what does one do when met with this conflict? Um, and this is a key question that I investigate in this, in this talk today. So when travelers set foot in the land of their dreams, they will almost certainly become disappointed upon discovering that reality is no match for their expectations. Depending on how invested emotionally they were in their mental preconceptions of the place, the voyagers will either accept reality for what it is, or attempt to block it out and dwell in an idealized dreamland. This tension was deeply rooted in the experience of Protestant American travelers to the Holy Land in the 19th century, many of whom had imagined that they would be able to access God through pastoral biblical scenes, but were instead met with what they perceived as desolation and spiritual emptiness. So in my talk today, I will focus on the experiences of one such traveler, Mark Twain in his voyage to the Holy Land as depicted in The Innocents Abroad. So in his travel narrative, uh, published in 1869, Twain gives an account of what he calls his great pleasure excursion uh, to Europe and Palestine aboard the Quaker City steamship. So unlike the Quaker City pilgrims he mocks, uh, who show blind, blind devotion to the holy land sites, however, uh, Twain claims to view the sites objectively. In the preface to his travel narrative, Twain writes that he has viewed everything with impartial eyes and is sure he has written at least honestly, whether wisely or not. Um, and indeed, he openly expresses his disillusionment from what he sees as a barren scenery with no traces of the divine. So summing up his impressions, he writes, Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered in fields and fettered its energies. Palestine is desolate and unlovely. So while Twain is uh, obviously disappointed with the landscape, he finds himself simultaneously enchanted and unsettled by emblems that include ancient relics and sacred stones at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre believed by Orthodox and Catholic Christians to be the place of Jesus' crucifixion and burial. This results in these rare displays of piety uh, within an otherwise cynical, famously irreverent narrative. Um, and I want to explore today uh, the roots of his um, enchantment with the church. Um, and in examining the visit within the, the mid-19th century um, context of deepening religious skepticism, I claim that the site allows Twain to reconnect uh, temporarily to what was lost in his own crisis of faith with the help of the material artifacts and layers of tradition. So despite his claims to objectivity, his perception of the church is not necessarily governed by what he sees, but rather by what he needs to believe is true. The site enables him to hold on to a shred of sanctity, thus escaping complete spiritual darkness. So behind his irreverent tone then, we see this kind of really earnest desire um, to cling both to his touristic expectations um, and to his faith. <coughs> so 
In scholarship on this travel narrative, uh, critics have highlighted Twain's vacillation between his authorial pose um, as this kind of credulous, wide-eyed tourist, um, and that of the skeptical, uh, critical traveler who debunks the, the shams and humbuggery of old world tourism. Um, but less attention has been devoted um, to Twain's capitulation to the lure of material artifacts. So in focusing on these kind of moments in the narrative, um, I want to illuminate these underlying tensions between the forces of the spiritual and material. Um, and this tension, I believe, is really at the center um, of 19th century Protestant Americans' pilgrimage experience. And by this dualism of the spiritual and material, um, I'm referring to the Protestant tenet of incorporeal faith versus the more material representations of the sacred within the Catholic Church. Um, so Twain's um, repeated, albeit um, failed, attempts to locate a transcendent spirituality in the open landscape um, bespeak a Protestant romanticism that finds sanctity in the open scenery uh, rather than in institutionalized shrines. For Twain, religiosity is immaterial and interior. Um, so as a Protestant, his attraction then uh, to Catholic relics in the Holy Land is dangerously inconsistent with his religious beliefs. Um, and this tension, I claim, causes Twain to engage in self-deception uh, when visiting the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So while he attempts to reject the authenticity of the material artifacts, he's also kind of unwillingly um, captivated by them. Um, a fascination that, you can say, um, kind of intermittently rises and descends from the, from the narrative surface. Um, so while materiality and spirituality are um, commonly proposed, um, for Twain, one facilitates the other. It is through matter that he connects to God. Um, and also to give kind of another point of reference um, for this tendency among Protestant American travelers um, in Twain's time, I'm also going to look briefly at some of uh, Herman Melville's um, experiences in the, in the Holy Land. Um, but before though, looking at Twain's actual visit, I'd like to give uh, some background on, uh, on the atmosphere within which Twain uh, was writing. So Twain arrived at the Holy Land at a time when the U.S. was in the throes um, of a really deep crisis of faith, uh, triggered by factors like uh, the introduction of Darwinism um, and higher biblical criticism, uh, which challenged the authority of the Bible uh, as the ultimate source of truth. So Twain's simultaneous uh, skepticism of and adherence to material markers of faith becomes more understandable when considered within this context. Uh, within the context of this crisis. So the, popular, the popularization of scientific theories uh, threatened to undermine the mysterious, um, mystical dimensions of the divine um, and consequently cast doubt on, on traditional belief. And James de Coven, an, an Anglican priest, warned against the impact of such developments in his sermon, The Gates of the Invisible, delivered in 1878. Um, this was some time after the publication of Innocence Abroad, but we already see the impact of a rational and scientific approach um, to religion as early as the, the mid-19th century and even uh, before. So the discoveries of science, uh, de Coven points out, may seem to diminish the mysterious power uh, behind the natural world. And as he writes, the miracles of one age become the science of another. Law after law is discovered. What we once thought the direct working of the Father of all proves to be a mighty force. And in trying to explain uh, the weakening commitment among 19th century Americans to spirituality, he observes, the voice that seemed to say, thus far shalt thou come and no farther, recedes and recedes. Between us and God appear to come laws and forces and powers, the duration and extent of which we can grasp and measure. The visible encroaches on the invisible. What then if these laws begin to take us the place of God? Take to us the place of God, sorry. So in his emphasis on the visible impinging on the invisible, de Coven is illuminating this kind of really central phenomenon um, that I think is, is, um, is key to Twain's religious concerns in the innocence abroad. And that is the materialization of the spiritual. So with the scientific advancements, advancements, um, the laws that are governing the workings of the universe um, are becoming increasingly understandable. Um, and, and the result of that is really kind of de demystification of the world, um, accompanied by increasing religious skepticism. Um, and as a side note, 
um, another kind of aspect of this process of the materialization of, um, of the spiritual is also this increasing um, commodification of religion at the time um, within this kind of really rapidly um, industrialized society. Um, so we see this in the proliferation um, of strategies um, of marketing within churches, um, such as you know, the distribution of um, sensationalist um, religious reading material as part of this revolution um, in, in print production, um, or more generally, um, this really mass production um, of religious visual imagery at the time. Um, and of course, we have the mass codification of uh, religious sites uh, that Twain derives in, in Europe during his uh, visit. So religion itself is really becoming kind of uh, a commodity at the time. Um, something that Twain um, despised, um, but perhaps also became uh, susceptible to. Um, and that um, is some of the things that I want to explore actually during my time uh, here at uh, Court Farm. Um, so going back to Twain, um, we can then understand why the material artifacts of faith in the Holy Land were so seductive. So in this uh, increasingly um, spiritually empty world, these kind of concrete signifiers offer easier access to the divine. Um, and in a letter um, Twain writes to his brother in 1865, uh, so two years before his Holy Land journey, Twain describes his melancholy um, due to financial concerns and the intensity of his own uh, religious doubt. You are in trouble and in debt, so am I. I am utterly miserable, so are you. Perhaps your religion will sustain you, will feed you. I place no dependence in mine. Our religions are alike, though, in one respect. Neither can make a man happy when he is out of luck. If I do not get out of debt in three months, pistols or poisons for one, exit me. <laughs> so this portrait of Twain reveals a spiritual darkness uh, lurking behind um, this light-hearted, humorous tone in the narrative, um, which really indicates, I think, the stakes behind the struggle to uh, preserve the, the, the land's sanctity. So Twain's uh, vision of the land was heavily shaped by his own romantic expectations. And I want to provide some background um, on the Holy Land in the American imaginary um, in order to give a sense of these expectations. Um, and this context, I think, is important because it's really through it that I read his, um, his disappointment and uh, subsequent insistence on a holy experience at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So Protestant Americans um, of the 19th century had a deep, really intimate connection uh, with the Holy Land. In his book, To See a Promised Land, Lester Vogel explains the origins of this attachment, claiming that for most Americans, the concept of the Holy Land was infused with emotional and sentimental associations. As an emotional idea, it was powerfully bound with other idealisms held quite close to many hearts, the Bible, one's church, and even one's home. For frequently, the emotions that arose within many were of the sweetest associations of youth and earth, of Bible stories and fireside readings. Um, and we see here uh, on the slide um, a copy of the Bible that Twain purchased for his mother um, during his stay in, uh, in Jerusalem. Um, so within American culture, uh, there developed what Hilton Bobenziger calls Holy Land mania, an obsession with the Holy Land that resulted in a proliferation of religious theme parks, stereographic tours, um, guidebooks, and travel narratives, not to mention actual travel um, to Palestine. And one uh, prominent example of a Holy Land attraction in the US was Palestine Park, um, a large-scale model of the Holy Land in Chautauqua, New York, where visitors um, would basically dress in oriental um, garb um, and wander through these replicas of pilgrimage sites um, in this really beautiful, serene setting um, by the lake, uh, and also participate in biblical reenactments. So the park also incorporated um, actual objects from the Holy Land, such as bits of stone and wood um, and, and vials of water. Uh, and the aim was to provide visitors with this immersive um, and, and thus authentic experience of the Holy Land, um, serving as a surrogate form of, of uh, pilgrimage, um, despite being a symbolic replica. Um, and also, you know, the existence of Holy Land theme parks today um, illustrate the persistent interest in, um, in this form of amusement. So the simulated geography in the park, um, along with the imported relics, 
created um, what we can see as kind of a slippage uh, between model and reality, resulting in this idealized, uh, domesticated uh, vision of Palestine. So whether actual or simulated, Americans sought through their Holy Land visits um, to get in touch with the real. The Holy Land was where they could go to reconnect uh, with their uh, imagined origins and reinvigorate national identity. Um, and this was especially needed following the trauma of the Civil War um, and the wave of religious uh, skepticism at the time. Travelers envisioned the Holy Land as this place uh, where they could go to validate their faith, um, grounding their beliefs by seeing where the biblical scenes actually took place. And just to give you um, a sense of another kind of element uh, that went into the construction of the Holy Land um, in, in American imagination um, and the kind of idealization that it um, created, so people would also take um, stereographic tours of the Holy Land. Uh, so the stereoscope is a device um, kind of similar to opera glasses that allow people uh, to blend two photographs together, um, creating um, the sense of, of reality in a sense. Um, this kind of 3D image. Um, and with the aid of this device, people would gaze at these hyper-realistic photographs uh, of the Holy Land, feeling as if they're taking a simulated tour. Um, and it, what's interesting is that even within this kind of perfected vision um, of the Holy Land presented in these images, um, there were these occasional disturbances sometimes, such as um, European tourists in the corner um, of the frame that kind of threatened to, to fracture the illusion. Um, so accordingly, uh, the commentary um, that accompanied these images requested uh, that the viewers disregard uh, these intrusions and imagine instead that they were wearing uh, biblical garments. Um, so just to, again, to give you a kind of sense of the, of the illusions um, that we're seeing um, being created at the, at the time. Um, so Twain's own romantic expectations of Palestine quickly dissipate upon his arrival, um, yet he openly registers his disappointment. This is in line with his own um, self-representation uh, as a truth-teller, right, who, who embraces this uh, critical gaze of, of modernity. Uh, unlike his fellow pilgrims who entered, uh, who quote, entered the country with their verdicts already prepared, unquote. So when met with this barren scenery, um, he claims to adjust his romantic uh, preconceptions to accommodate reality, admitting that he, quote, must try to reduce his ideas of Palestine to a more reasonable shape. So for him, Galilee is, quote, a sailless, tintless lake that is expressionless, expressionless and unpoetical. Jerusalem is mournful and dreary and lifeless. Mm -hmm. Nazareth is forlorn. Jericho, the accursed, lies a moldering ruin today. Renowned Jerusalem itself, the stateliest name in history, has lost all its ancient grandeur, unquote. And yet, when he visits the ruins uh, near Galilee, where Jesus is said to have gathered his disciples, we see his tone shift from discouraged to solemn um, and almost reverential. And it's there um, where this appeal of tangible uh, sanctity begins to affect him, I think. So while he's inclined to reject the site's authenticity, something about the physicality of it entices him. And he becomes really unsettled by this clash between his longing for material evidence of the divine um, and his instinctive attachment to um, an invisible, immaterial, spiritual world. Um, and this tension between the material and spiritual is really apparent, I think, in his, in his contemplations. So he writes, it seems curious enough to us to be standing on ground that was once actually pressed by the feet of the Savior. The situation is suggest suggestive of a reality and a tangibility that seem at variance with the vagueness and mystery and ghostliness that one naturally attaches to the character of a god. So Twain's discomfort, I think, from uh, this conflict verges on anxiety. I cannot comprehend yet that I am sitting where a god has stood and looking upon the brook and the mountains which that god looked upon. I cannot comprehend this. The gods of my understanding have always been hidden in clouds and very far away. So the material traces of the divine, um, as, represented, uh, as represented by the ruins, are seductive in their tangibility, challenging his own typically internal spiritual experience. Uh, so while Protestant visual culture 
um, was on the rise in Twain's time, you know, going back to this idea of commodification of religion, materialization, um, thus popularizing more material forms of uh, religiosity, his apprehension here reflects the Protestant commitment to sola scriptura, by which one can access God through the word alone, not via images, bodies, and places. Uh, so as historian John Butler writes, Protestantism centers itself on grace, not place. And yet, despite this tension, I think, we can see Twain's um, deep desire to uphold the site's uh, legitimacy. So he notes that he uh, cannot comprehend that he is walking where Jesus walked while already buying into the very idea. Um, so within this dynamic, um, Twain is, uh, we can see, um, say, mediating the site's authenticity um, via the tangibility of matter, um, not to mention the kind of tactile, sensory um, experience of again, being where uh, Jesus walked. So at Galilee, Twain begins to forge a link between the sacred um, and the tangible. And this is in stark contrast um, to his um, contempt of Catholic material culture um, in European churches, which he um, visited before arriving to the Holy Land um, as part of his grand tour. So complaining about uh, the seemingly endless holy relics he encounters in various churches, he notes, but isn't this relic matter a little overdone? We find a piece of the true cross in every old church we go into and some of the nails that held it together. In Italy, upon seeing frescoes of suffering martyrs, he remarks, we were in the heart and home of priestcraft, of a happy, cheerful, contented ignorance, superstition, degradation, poverty, indolence, and everlasting, unaspiring worthlessness. The relics he describes are nothing more than Jesuit hum humbuggery. Um, and his approach also seems to extend to the holy sites um, in Palestine that are controlled by, uh, by Catholics as well. So he calls the grottos, for instance, that he sees um, bogus or an imposture. <laughs> so when we combine um, these impressions with his condemnation of the barren landscape, it seems that there's no room for doubt, right? Um, the Holy Land will not provide evidence of the truth of the Bible. However, things change when he arrives at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Church offers an escape from desolate reality, despite its complex status in the Protestant worldview. Um, so the belief in the, in the authenticity of the Church indicates this kind of rupture in Protestant faith, um, as it detracts from the individual's personal, unimpeded relationship with God, and instead credits the site as holy um, because multitudes believe it is so. Um, so Christians of all denominations um, would visit the site, continue to visit the site, um, many viewing it as the pinnacle of their journey. Um, and although Protestants were included within those who would frequent the church, um, many would uh, make the visit to the site only in order to uh, reject its authenticity, uh, which is in turn supposed to enhance their faith. Um, and my assertion is that Twain constructs a narrative of holiness around the site, um, which constitutes this kind of process of self-deception. So Twain basically um, doesn't subject uh, the church to the same uh, harsh scrutiny that he applies uh, to other holy sites. Um, doing so allows him to counterbalance his complete disillusionment. Um, so basically I'm seeing his um, actions as a key kind of um, inconsistency in his touristic practices. Um, and as a side note, I want to also acknowledge um, that in focusing on these connections um, between Twain's sentimental moments um, in the narrative and his religious concerns, um, I'm joining and I'm also influenced by scholars such as Milet Shamir, uh, Brian Yothers, uh, Jeffrey Melton, um, and Harold Bush. Um, so going back to Twain's um, account, right, um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is one of the rare sites that has a mysterious effect on him. Um, before actually entering, he becomes captivated by the idea of the church, noting that after being, quote, surfeited with sights um, of the land, nothing has any fascination for us now but the church of the Holy Sepulchre, unquote. He returns daily, quote, we have been there every day and have not grown tired of it, but we are weary of everything else, unquote. So while Twain um, openly criticizes um, the sites he sees, he criticizes um, those that, that um, idealize them. Um, his tone becomes really reverent at the, at the church. Um, however, this change of heart doesn't come immediately. Uh, so at the beginning of his visit there, um, Twain gives this kind of sarcastic appraisal 
um, of the different artifacts located at the site. Um, so he affirms their genuineness, um, but offers um, um, implausible reasoning, um, as if he's kind of anticipating uh, the rationalizations um, he believes are used by these excessively um, pious pilgrims. Uh, so this occurs when he peers through a dark window um, to catch a glimpse of what a local priest says is a fragment from the pillar um, on which Jesus was repeatedly uh, scourged. So Twain explains that the darkness uh, prevents one from seeing the fragment. Um, however, he adds, the pilgrim can take a stick um, held nearby and thrust it through the window um, to make contact with the fragment, um, quote, and then he no longer doubts that the true pillar, pillar of flagellation is in there. Um, so Twain's sarcastic tone uh, reveals, we can say, his, his lack of seriousness, um, and as if to hammer in the point, he reiterates that the pilgrim, quote, cannot have any excuse to doubt the fragment's authenticity, for he can feel it with the stick. He can feel it as distinctly as he, as he could feel anything, unquote. However, Twain then arrives um, at the spot where Jesus um, was said to, have, uh, said to be crucified, and this, he says, uh, quote, affects one differently. So after having acknowledged um, the land's lack of sanctity um, and dealing with his the subsequent disappointment, um, Twain is really desperate for proof of God's presence. Uh, and the church with its, with its flux of material, objects of faith, uh, successfully transports him. So in observing the spot marking where Jesus was crucified, Twain clings to the idea of its genuine, saying that one fully believes that he is looking upon the very spot where the Savior gave up his life. Twain justifies this assertion with logical reasoning, explaining that Jesus' um, divine status uh, had earned him devout crowds of followers throughout his life, and that to publicly execute such a personage was sufficient in itself to make the locality of the execution a memorable place for ages. So Twain points out that generations of family um, would uh, kind of point out to one another um, the spot where the Son of God um, is buried, which proves its authenticity. Uh, so he says, fathers would tell their sons about the strange affair and point out the spot. The sons would transmit the story to their children, and thus a period of 300 years would easily be spent. And so, and then to kind of further validate um, this explanation, he surprisingly cites uh, the man whom he has been mocking throughout uh, the entire narrative, which is William C. Prime, uh, the author of Tent Life in the Holy Land, which was um, the guidebook used by most Christian pilgrims uh, at the time. So Twain believes Prime to be the quintessential example of the sentimental pilgrim. Um, and in other chapters, he consistently uh, refers to him as W.M.C. Grimes, calling his writing a rule. Um, but despite his feelings of contempt um, towards such romanticizing travelers, um, Twain stresses that his last explanation, quote, is Mr. Prime's, not his, unquote. So Twain is so anxious to legitimate um, the site that he's even willing to take uh, Prime's word for it. And it's crucial to note that this is really the only moment um, in, the, in the text um, where, he, uh, where Twain calls Prime by his actual name, indicating his, you can say, his, his lack of cynicism. Um, and he adds a side note also, saying that uh, Prime's explanation is uh, full of good sense and that he borrowed it from his tenth life. And he also ends us by signing his, his initials as if to convince um, incredulous readers um, that he's truly the, citing the man whom he has been um, ridiculing throughout the entire book. Um, so Twain then finishes his meditation about the spot, um, but not before securing once more its validity, um, stating that, quote, it is not possible that there can be any mistake about the locality of the crucifixion. Um, so in buying into the site's legitimacy, he pushes away his inherent um, aversion to Catholic, uh, what he calls Catholic superstition. Um, so in Twain's response um, embodies precisely what um, literary scholar Jenny Franchot um, calls in her study of antebellum American religion, um, Protestant Americans, um, quote, conflicted response of repulsion and longing, unquote, provoked by their encounter with Catholicism. So American tourists at the time engaged in what she calls um, the bodily gaze of Protestantism. And as she explains, issues of the body, of church architecture, of art and of food, converge to form a distinctive Protestant gaze on Rome, a gaze that acknowledged Catholicism's spiritual desire, celebrated Catholicism as spectacle, 
and fantasy the consumption of this foreign substance rather than conversion to it. So Americans, in the sense, um, at the time were fascinated by the rituals um, and aesthetics of Catholicism, um, but also made, to sure, made sure to keep a crucial distance from them. So Twain is not alone in uh, being simultaneously uh, drawn to um, and unsettled by, by the church. Um, Herman Melville, another Protestant American um, irreverent traveler, um, also arrived at the church after experiencing um, intense disappointment with the land um, as part of his own Holy Land journey in 1857. Uh, so he observed in his journal uh, that no country uh, will more quickly dissipate romantic expectations than Palestine, uh, particularly Jerusalem. Um, and writing of his first visit to the church, Melville notes, broken dome, anointing stone lamps, dingy, queer smell. Um, however, his negative reaction, um, interestingly, doesn't stop him um, from returning to the site almost every day um, of his eight-day stay in Jerusalem, um, which becomes kind of peculiar given his initial disappointment. And he describes his ritual as follows. Here almost every day I would hang, looking down upon the spectacle of the scornful Turks on the divan, and the scorned pilgrims kissing the stone of the anointing. Uh, his compulsive returns, I think, we, um, seem almost against his will um, when we consider his disdainful gaze, um, indicating the effective power of, of the church. So although Melville um, ultimately rejects uh, the site's genuineness in his travel narrative, his epic poem Chorel, uh, published in 1876, um, so 20 years after his uh, Holy Land visit, um, show his, we can say, reprocessing of that, of that memory. Um, so similar to his impressions of the land in his journal, um, Clorel, um, in Clorel, Jerusalem is seen as, as desolate and, and barren. Um, and from the outset, Clorel, uh, who hopes to restore his faith by journeying to um, the, the Holy Land, determines that there are no deep messages um, beyond the surface of the city's stones, um, taking note of Jerusalem's, quote, blank, blank towers, unquote. However, um, there's one moment in Melville's depiction of the city uh, where the stones do speak, uh, but they are of the institutionalized kind. Um, and this occurs, again, at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So in his description, he first relates the idea that every spot in the church has a correlating moment in history. The narrator is swayed by the direct connection to Jesus that the Catholic Church offers. Tis here they scourged him, Soldiers yonder nailed, the victim to the tree in jeer. There stood the Jews, their merry pills, the vesture was divided here. And then the consistently blank stones uh, suddenly come to life. So a miracle play of haunted stone, a miracle play, a phantom one, he writes. It's important to note that um, this isn't a moment of spiritual conversion, um, but rather again shows the lure of the material. Um, this is a really an exceptional moment in the, in the narrative where the stones are um, miraculously injected with, uh, with holiness. And the narrator repeats these words twice, um, emphasizing say, the, the gravity of the, of the moment. Um, and this scene is in contrast to the moment in uh, Melville's journal, um, where he stares at um, um, the reputed tomb of Jesus um, and comments, unquote, the ineloquence of the bedizened slab, unquote. Um, and in his book, um, American Geographies, Bruce Harvey closely examines this sentence, um, stating that it shows that Melville wishes to, quote, hear a voice from the tomb, unquote, um, going against the Protestant tenets that reject such artifacts. Um, so the unhinging effect of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre um, is apparent, right? Similar to uh, Twain, Melville finds it uh, difficult to resist the seductive quality of the shrine and its artifacts. So for both travelers, materiality uh, facilitates the sacred. Uh, and this makes sense when we consider that um, the world of the spiritual seemed, um, in their time, more out of reach than ever. With the world becoming um, increasingly demystified, um, immaterial forms of spirituality do not suffice. In turn, uh, Twain and Melville, for that matter, cannot allow themselves to condemn the artifacts. So through his visit, um, Twain then is able to hold on um, to at least some of his romantic preconceptions of the land. 
Um, the site, in short, offers Twain a fantasy he cannot refuse, um, nor uh, does he desire to put it to the test. The church becomes a place where time and space are suspended, um, and skepticism is pushed aside. So, unlike the landscape, the church offers transcendence. For the typical traveler, um, arriving at the, uh, the conviction that he has gained what he set out for is a key aspect of the journey. Uh, and the voyager's use of imagination is central in molding his experiences to his likings, um, particular after the journey is over. And Twain reflects on this notion upon arriving at his home at the end of his uh, long trip. So he writes, We are at home again. We are exhausted. We have full comfort in one reflection, however. Our experiences in Europe have taught us that in time, this fatigue will be forgotten. And then, all that will be left will be pleasant memories of Jerusalem. Memories we shall call up with always increasing interest as the years go by. Memories which someday will become all beautiful when the last annoyance that encumbers them shall have faded out of our minds, never again to return. We are satisfied. We can wait. Our reward will come. To us, Jerusalem, and today's experiences will be an enchanted memory a year hence. Memory which money could not buy from us. So the mind can transform the experience of any place, Twain explains. Um, and if the here and now is too close for one um, to believe in the holiness of Jerusalem, the passing of time will surely soften any empirical reality. Uh, however, without his experience uh, at the church, Twain would unlikely be able to take such a big leap of faith to convince himself of the land's sanctity. Um, therefore, at these moments of reflection on his enchanted memory of the land, we can assume that Twain's recollection of his visit to the church becomes an anchor, uh, shining bright in his heart. Um, then again, the book itself serves as a stark reminder uh, of a different kind of journey. And such ambivalence stands precisely at the heart um, of the Protestant American traveler's experience in the Holy Land. Thank you.